Uh, so this song, it's called The Lurgy Stream, and uh, it's a song that has uh, big associations in my family because my father used to uh, sing this song, and it's, it's a very simple um, traditional song, probably well known in the area I'm from, which is the northwest of Ireland, Donegal and Derry and County Tyrone. And uh, the, the, the verses, uh, there's not really much story, nothing much happens, but the reason that we love it is because the last verse mentions these place names that are, would ha if you were driving from Derry City, where I'm from, to the west of Donegal, where I've spent so much of my time learning music and hanging out, uh, you'd pass through these little places. So the funny thing about it is that I already knew two versions of this song. I, this is what happens with traditional songs. I, and instead of having four songs, I have four versions of the one song, you know. So I had two lovely melodies to it, but then I realized I had this melody hanging around from decades ago and I, I hoped to write lyrics to it, but I, I wasn't able to think of anything. And I suddenly thought, oh, I can put this melody to the lyric stream. So this is it. <laughs> To this country first I came My mind from love was free And the charms of the female sex Had not enticed me There I beheld a beauty bright who set my heart aflame Her dark brown hair blows in the air Down by the lurgy stream T'was on a Tuesday evening My love I chance to meet I held her in my arms and I gave her kisses sweet I asked her if she would marry me or single still remain or if she would cross the seas and leave I crossed over the seas with you I might get lots of blame You might fall in love with some other fair maid And leave me here in pain Young men are false and generous Perhaps you are the same But I would cross over the seas with you And leave a lurgy stream Likewise, lost Willie Shore, where many's the happy hour I spend. Will I e'er see thee more? And twice farewell to old Argash, where oft times I have been. Likewise, to kill.
you know, I guess when you were 17, 18, you moved to Dublin. That's right. And uh, you started a, a band called uh, Scar Bray. Yep. And uh, I was curious, what, what was the Dublin music scene like? And this is about 68, 69. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What, what, what kind of gigs was Scarborough getting? And what was the music scene like at that time? Well, there was, we, were, we had a folk boom just like you did uh, in America. And so there were all these little folk clubs. And some of them were just in coffee shops. Uh, but um, mo most of the main ones were centered on pubs. But it was very, it wasn't a sort of noisy pub scene. It was more like uh, you had a club that would start at nine o'clock. And the pubs shut in the winter at 11 or 11.30. So in, in the club, you might have three acts and a break and three acts. And so we, we might, myself and Michael O'Donnell were the first, we, we played together first, you know. And uh, so we would do two or three songs and then other people would do things. Then be a break and then we'd do another few songs afterwards. But the variety of wonderful traditional uh, musicians that were around, it was just fantastic. You know, really, really great. When did you discover the music of sort of the the pillars of English folk, uh, David Graham and John Renborn and and Bert Chance? When when did when and how really did you discover their music? Well, that was about sixty eight as well. I went to college uh, in sixty eight, and um, I had a friend called Jim McCluskey who lives in Santa Cruz, and um, he was always several steps ahead of us. I don't know if you have friends like that. Uh, he was always ahead of us and uh, what he heard so he he played me a pentangle record and it i could tell it was great but i didn't understand what was going on i just couldn't the brain couldn't comprehend but we went to see them live and then we we're just dazzled of course by the guitar playing and the arrangements and the sound and in uh, scarabray we, we we mimicked them a lot of the time as well we were trying to do something like what they were doing as well as doing our own thing with harmonies and so on. So uh, just seeing the possibilities that Yanch and Renburn were exploring was very inspiring. And, and we did try to imitate them, but sure, we got nowhere near them. I mean, looking at them now, even on, on videos, you know, on YouTube, I see Yanch doing these masterpieces as well. So where did you learn, you know, Dad Gad, and when did that first uh, come into your sights? Well, it was very simple. We got the, we started getting Bert Yanch's so solo albums as well. So. On the back of the album, uh, we saw these tunings listed, and one of them was Dadgad. And so in Scarabray, we had four singers. We were always harmonizing and so on. But we had a keyboard and two guitars. And it occurred to us, uh, we tried tuning. I tuned to Dadgad. And then I could complement what Michal was doing. He would be in standard. I'd be in Dadgad. And so that was really how it started off. Um, and then, uh, so it was just an interesting thing. It wasn't a big thing. And then uh, when Michal, after Scarabray broke up, uh, we kind of diverged a wee bit and Michal got in with the Bothy Band, who are one of the great Irish bands, and he mm -hmm. started using Dad Gad. And uh, then for a short while I was doing all sorts, playing electric guitar and playing blues and other bands and stuff. And then I gradually got back into Dad Gad myself in a different way. And that was partly inspired by the sounds on Joni Mitchell's Blue album, strange mm -hmm. enough. This is one of these things I forgot for a long, long time. But I remembered that I was listening to that, and you know, you have Case of You, and it's really dulcimer and guitar and all. But I suddenly realized, hang on, some of these sounds are in Dad Gad. So uh, then um, I, that was that got me back to Dad Gad. And then one night, a huge. Tr see, in Irish music, we have the vocal stuff, and and that's a very complex business trying to arrange that for accompaniment without ruining it. You know. And then you have the tune, the, the dance tunes, which are all in these rhythms, solid rhythms. But myself and Michal doing in standard tuning, it didn't sound good. Uh, so Michal had started using Dad Gad with the Bathy Band. And then one night I was in this club we used to go to, an Irish language club. And a girl was there and she said, had a whistle. And she said, look, Dahi, get out your guitar and play, accompany, accompany me. So it just happened to be in Dad Gad and I started playing. I thought, oh. Hang on, this all just worked. It's just kind of worked. Why do you think that that translates so well to like jigs and reels? Well, different people use it different ways, but the way I used it, uh, looking back, I think that the the reason it worked for me was that it's, it got me away from chords in a way. You know, like I know I'm sort of playing chords a lot of the time, but in a sense I'm playing harmonies and basses and kind of counterpoint or something, and they're not full chords. And that... Uh, that, that gives an openness for Irish music. It gives a space. 
uh, mm -hmm. for the kind of scales that they use in Irish music. That's a kind of semi-theoretical explanation. But I think it's really true. You know, the, the, the kind of uh, full chords uh, that you might play on the guitar or on the piano, which was used, they kind of trap the tune. And I think that openness uh, was really nice. And then uh, eventually I also realized that, of course, the pipes which formed Irish mu music in many ways, they're, the two drones are D and A on the pipes. So there you've got it immediately. You're droning, you've got D and A droning. And so this song um, is a song in Irish now, and I learned most of my songs in the Irish Gaelic language when I was a teenager. And this is one I learned in Ranafast, which is this uh, tiny little area um, in the west of Donegal, what we call the Gaeltacht, the Irish speaking area. And it's renowned for its, the language itself and also for the poetry, uh, people writing in the old poetic style right up to the present day. So I learned a lot of songs there, and this song originated um, in the province of Connacht. It didn't originate where I learned it. And I learned two different melodies to this one as well. And it's funny because one of them is a very jolly, jaunty melody, and one of them is incredibly sad. So the, I'll do the sad one, and um, but this is just a straightforward love song. Again, nothing much happens. But the melody is very well known to people who play uh, Irish music for, because it's uh, this. It's used as a slow air, what we call a slow air, to play as a solo piece on, on fiddle or accor accordion, as, and it's known as Anna Cooing. Uh, so it's a different set of words to the one song. So it's called Myron Ye Ain, and Myron Ye Ain would have been the name of the girl he's madly in love with. <laughs> Well, she dared drill a brat's penis, stand up in hell and lurch gristle and tree. Ask up an air and the sod the vision, and pause a glegal tam wally. Assassins and rank the heaven and spain and dregs a rasherish of rock lock rain ye the bell in the cave sneak a me fair in your be marie damn she post the blood no hoy ke trin lock and hard Quintius cost thee the huling spoil through in ye and shoij van tamwalili.
let's talk about Alton for a little while. Uh, you've been with them now for more than 20 years, right? Yeah, it's probably since uh, I first played with Mairead and Frankie, who were the heart of Alton in the early 80s, in fact. So uh, uh, the band probably got going officially about 86 or 87. And I was doing some gigs with them from the beginning. How would you describe the differences in maybe in how you sounded back in the early 90s compared to today? You know, in a way that I don't, the heart of the sound of the band, I don't think has changed radically. Um, but I think that we've just kind of developed our style and got better at, better at what we're doing. Um, and probably more confident at you know, using our style to do other things because it was a very narrow focus at first. We were going to do rare Donegal music. Donegal music wasn't known outside Donegal hardly. Right. And that was going to be what we did. And that was the music that uh, Frank and Mairead knew so well and I knew the songs so well um, that that seemed to, you know, to make a lot of sense. But with the passing of time, there's, you know, you say to yourself, well, we've done X number of albums that are of this music. Can we do something a wee bit different? And what I think we've discovered is that we can just try anything and use our approach. But if it's a lovely song or a lovely tune, it works whether it's from Donegal or not, or whether it's from Ireland or not even. You know, mm -hmm. like on the new album, we have got American songs and all. I think they sound nice. I wanted to talk to you about the, the new album. It's called The Widening Gyre. Um, and you recorded it in Nashville. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what did being in that location, how did that influence the sessions and the, the final musical product? Well, it had, uh, it had a huge influence. That part of the point of doing it in Nashville was just to get us all together in the one place uh, so we could really, really concentrate. You know, when you're at home and everybody has their different distractions, that makes it difficult. So that was part of the thing. But also we had the notion of doing some sort of collaboration with American bluegrass or American traditional musicians for a long time. And because even though our music is different, there's a, we're like cousins, there's a common aesthetic or something. And we had done a few projects with Dolly Parton uh, that were, you know, very, very fun. And we'd met... One of the projects was a live album in the 90s and uh, as well as Dolly herself who's a wonderful fantastic person a uh, great singer uh, she had all these great musicians there uh, Alison Krauss's band and Alison herself and the McCurries McCurry mm -hmm. brothers and we jammed with them and talked about songs and so that was that idea of somehow doing a collaboration was hanging around for a long time was there any collaborator on this album that really stood out to you that really impressed you more more than you thought you'd be impressed well we were making it in compass studios so that was gary west and his wife was alison brown Alison who's brown. Was a mm -hmm. fantastic uh banjo player so i suppose that the combination of their music and their input had the most influence mm -hmm. uh you know it helped us most uh but you know, the, all the musicians that we heard were, were fantastic. We were just like children, you know, when we heard them going and playing. And they played, we played some stuff together, but then maybe somebody would come in and dub something in. And uh, to hear, as I've mentioned Stuart Duncan earlier, to hear him playing and the, the amount of creativity he had was just fantastic. And I think the crucial thing uh, is, you know, that we weren't trying to play bluegrass and they weren't trying to play Irish. They were being them, and we were being us, and putting them together, and that's what works, I think. You are play a bourgeois now, yeah. And uh, I was wondering how how that uh, arrangement came about, and how, how you started playing that. So some years ago, we were doing a double bill with Rand, uh, Ricky Skaggs and his band. So um, and he was a very nice man, of course. And one night he popped his head into the dressing room and said, "Oh well, we're off tomorrow night. Uh, are you playing?" And we said, yeah, we're playing Eugene, Oregon. We're playing in the place called the Wow Hall, W-O-W -W Hall. And I said, that's what we're playing. He said, you know, I might just come. And we thought, you know. So we went to the Wow Hall the next day and we were sitting around backstage, maybe before sound check even, just hanging around. Next second, Ricky Skaggs came in with one of his band. He said, oh yeah, we just rented a car and we came down. And, and we sat around uh, and had a great uh, chat. And in fact, he, he got up and did some stuff with us. I mean, the people in the room must have been totally astounded. But uh, part of the conversation, he was talking about instruments. And of course, 
you know, we were talking, you know, before we were on camera here about uh, the tack. I mean, how a, a useful guitar. It's a very sweet guitar, but maybe it's people would look down on it compared to Martins and Bourgeois and so on. But anyhow, so I was wondering. Uh, I felt slightly shy about my lovely tack. but anyhow, he said, uh, "Oh yeah, that's lovely. That's a great guitar." And he said, "But we were all playing these Bourgeois guitars. You've got to have one." And we thought, well, what does that mean? He said, I should go out and buy one or what does <laughs> So anyhow, he very kindly organized me to get one. And I was just going over uh, to, you know, as a gift or whatever. And uh, I was going over to Ireland uh, to record with the band a month or two after that. And the day I was leaving, this UPS came up outside in this big cardboard box, opened the cardboard box, it was the case, opened the case, this lovely Ricky Skagg signature guitar. So that was I had that for many years, and then just a couple of years ago, um, I was in a sh- on a guitar buying expedition with friends, and I ended up getting a Slope D as well, and it's just absolutely gorgeous, and I play that all the time, really. You also have a, uh, a seventy four Martin D twenty eight that yes. sounds like it's been through the ringer. Yes, it's been busted. I think roughly five times, like the neck. I think the first time it got busted, then that's it's vulnerable you know um so uh you might say well why did i keep on checking it but you get a better case and you think oh no it'll be fine but uh yeah it got broken over and over again and it's a lovely beautiful guitar and it's got uh, great character and very sweet uh but with a strong bass but um you know i might use it if i was driving somewhere but basically uh it sits, sits at home and as i said you know i've been playing that i'm so happy with the bourgeois i think it has everything that I want, you know, in a guitar. Uh, this is um, an instrumental tune that I made up probably in the 80s and um, uh, the, I'm on a concert tour at the moment so I've been telling this story every night but it's it's true. <laughs> um, I was uh, studying in my mother's house. My mother ha- had a cottage about a, um, about 12 miles away from Maraid, our lead singer, um, and uh, she was having a birthday party. So I was sitting there and I thought, uh, I have got to bring a present but I didn't have any presents and I just wasn't in a position to run out to. There were, there's no shops around, <laughs> a store around. So I thought I'll try and make up a tune and um, uh, usually that doesn't work, you know, if you instantly want to make a tune. I've often dedicated tunes to people, but usually it was in retrospect or someone I say, oh, I'll dedicate that tune. So funny enough, I, I don't usually say this in the introduction on stage, but in fact, I made up two tunes. I made up a tune and I thought that isn't good enough. And then I made up, and I don't think Maria's ever heard the tune that wasn't good enough, but I made up the second tune and uh, it was quite nice and I ended up playing it to her that night. And I've recorded it with Liz Carroll on a CD of hers, just the two of us, me accompanying her, and it's, uh, I loved the way she played it. And then just recently, I've um, various people, friends have recorded, but recently I recorded it with Alton, so that was really nice and we had, um, guest musicians playing on it as well as Alton, including Stuart Duncan. I was very excited by that because I had you know, been following him over the years to some extent and to have him in the studio playing on the piece that I'd made up was tremendous. So it's stu- I just called it Tune for Maraid and Anna Nguyeni. It was both their birthdays. Mm-hmm. 